Welcome to the Grok Shop and my new series on home networking. In this video, I'm going to give some tips on how to improve your home networking experience. I'll be providing an outline of these tips and chapter markers in the description below if you want to skip ahead. For this video, I only assume that you have basic knowledge of these networking components. So coming in from the internet, we have our modem, or some vendors call them gateways. It's tomato and tomato, really. This component can consist of firewall, modem, and it can also have your Wi-Fi router as well. But usually a better configuration will be to have your own Wi-Fi router for reasons I'll explain later. And of course, this device can also have your firewall, uh, a switch, and a router. So it actually does quite a few jobs for you. The typical configuration will be to have your Wi-Fi router as an access point, have all your devices connected to whatever band you have configured in your Wi-Fi router. Since your router typically has a limited number of ports, a lot of times people will add a switch, 24 port, 32, however many ports you need to get more wired connections. And these will be devices, of course, that you don't necessarily need to move around a lot. Which brings us to tip number one. Wires are greater than air. What do I mean? Um, an Ethernet connection will just simply destroy a Wi-Fi connection in terms of available bandwidth. And that's because each device will have a dedicated, typically these days, a gigabit link. Uh, pretty soon it'll be 10 gigabits and 100 gigabits. And I repeat, it's dedicated, not shared among other devices. The speed you see advertised for Wi-Fi, keep in mind that's a max combined speed for all devices sharing the link at any one time. A good analogy to bandwidth is a pipe. Here you can see a 16 port ethernet switch, how it compares to Wi-Fi level five, which is also known as AC in the old parlance, or level four, which is known as N in the old parlance. And this graphic's being very generous to Wi-Fi. It's basically giving idealized conditions to Wi-Fi. But even so, you can see the 16 port ethernet dwarfing the AC or level five by about five times. But that's not even the half of it. If we take away the ideal conditions of Wi-Fi and we start comparing against more real world bandwidths, you can see the situation gets even more stark. So hopefully this will help you appreciate why wired connections can be superior to Wi-Fi in situations where it's possible to use wired connections. So hopefully you have ethernet wiring where you live, and if you do, I hope you're using it, but what if you don't? Well, one possibility is to use Mocha, which allows you to do networking over coax, and the Mocha 2.0 will do up to a gigabit speed. From what I've read, Mocha is compatible with most cable providers. You may have problems though if you have AT&T Uverse or satellite providers. Be sure to check it out for whatever provider you have. Some routers will even provide one end of the Mocha connection for you and you just need a single box like this. In other cases, you'll need one Mocha box on each side of your coax. It just depends on your configuration. I'll put some links to these below in the description. If Mocha can't work for you, another possibility is to use power line adapters, which allows you to do networking over your electrical lines. It can be a little more problematic. That's why I don't recommend it as a first choice, but this technology has improved in recent years, so it may be a viable option. I'll put links to these below as well. Okay, so moving on, the next tip would be to balance your load. So by wiring up as many devices as possible, you've already gone a long way towards this end, but also you wanna think about how you're distributing your load across your Wi-Fi radios. Most modern routers will have two or three radios, one in 2.4 gigahertz and one or two in the five gigahertz band. A good strategy here will be to put your more distant or lower bandwidth hungry devices on a 2.4 gigahertz band and use your five gigahertz bands for devices that are nearer to your router and have higher bandwidth needs. For example, your smart refrigerator or your solar panel monitor might be on the 2.4, whereas your mobile devices might be on your five gigahertz. Most devices will have a setting which lets you ignore certain SSIDs, and this is one way you could possibly um, gate certain devices and force them into certain lanes. So other than manually assigning lanes for your Wi-Fi radio, there is another technology out there called Smart Connect. Smart Connect basically um, assigns the same SSID to all of your radios, and then the device and the router will negotiate for the best lane for that device. Um, it's got mixed reviews. It's relatively new technology, but it might be worth checking out if you just don't have enough of your own bandwidth to do the manual configuration. 
Okay, next tip probably seems really obvious, but place your router somewhere in a very centralized location. Avoid the use of repeaters, range extenders, meshes, whatever you want to call them. Um, we'll talk about those more in a minute, but I think sometimes we just get tempted to put the router next to the modem in an easy location or what have you. Um, but going the extra mile, putting the router in the right place can really save you a lot of headache. Okay, next tips four and five. We got a two for here. Scan your neighbors and choose dead air. So hopefully you're good friends with your neighbors, but in fact, when it comes to Wi-Fi, your neighbors can be your enemies because you may be overlapping the same channels. And if your channels are overlapping and interfering with each other, that's bad for your mojo. So basically you wanna be watching what channels your neighbors are on. There's lots of ways to do this and there's a lot of free apps available. Um, the app I use is called Wi-Fi Analyzer and pretty much um, it just shows you different ways of viewing different channels that are in use. My channels are the Cosmic Kahuna channels. So you can see I have two access points going here. It looks like about um, channel six. And then I have a neighbor here showing up about like channel nine and um, I'm running in 40 megahertz mode and looks like they have uh, 40 megahertz and 20 megahertz going and this is on just one side of my house if i was on another side of my house i have a lot more activity on that side um, so you kind of have to find a sweet spot where you have the least amount of overlap um, giving the totality of interference that you have and i live in an area with big properties and i don't have a huge amount of interference but if you're in apartments or something like that it could get pretty crazy you can see I had the 2.4 gigahertz up first. This is the five gigahertz view now. And I have literally nobody in sight um, from this side of my house. Uh, other side of my house would show people uh, at least a couple of access points, I think in five gigahertz, but um, yeah, it's not, not a problem for me to choose channels here, but um, for sure, most people will have more interference than this. And so again, the idea being just um, find the sweet spot and check it periodically because your neighbors will probably change channels. You might get new neighbors with different routers and most people don't even know what channel they're on. <laughs> so uh, just uh, you're just going to have to experiment and find a good quiet uh, channel if possible that you can use. For those who might not know, changing channels on your router is super easy. Just point your browser to your router, log in, go to your wireless settings page, and select the proper radio. In this case, I'm going to do my in-band radio, and here you can see the channel set to channel 8. A lot of times it should be set to auto by default. so. Uh, make sure you take it off auto and set your channel manually unless you're completely satisfied with your settings already. So your router may look a little different from mine, but follow these basic instructions. They're all pretty much the same essentially, and you should be able to figure it out. Okay, tip number six, use wide bands where feasible. Earlier in the video, I showed some Wi-Fi signals. If you look at the green arc versus the pink arc, that's a 20 megahertz versus a 40 megahertz Wi-Fi signal. Pretty much the bit rate that you can get is proportional to the bandwidth. So the area under the curve of the pink is going to be roughly double the area under the curve of the green. So that shows you how you can get a higher bit rate from a higher bandwidth. So the caveat to using wide bands is that wide bands are going to be more prone to interference. And I would only recommend running wider bands in situations where you have a relatively quiet piece of the spectrum that you can occupy. So back in our router settings, you'll find the bandwidth setting near the mode and channel settings. Pretty much the in-band will have 20 or 40 megahertz bandwidths. And then if you change to AC mode, or if you're already in AC mode, you'll see a different range of widths. So you might have to do a little bit of experimentation to see what fits well to minimize the interference and get you that highest possible bit rate. Okay, tip seven, use a custom DNS server. Uh, by default, most people will be using their ISP's DNS and usually that's not the best selection and I'll give an example of that here in a minute. But first, a quick overview of what DNS does. So basically, when you go to a new URL, like in this example, we have www.wikipedia.org, your computer doesn't go to URLs, it only goes to IP addresses. So it has to figure out what is the IP address for that URL. And the DNS system is the lookup system for that. So without going into too many details, suffice to say it can be very complicated and slow. Um, and any way you can speed up this process is only gonna be to your advantage. 
There's a couple different ways you can speed up this process. The easiest, simplest way is to simply change your DNS server and you can change it per computer or you can change it in your router so that computers that use DHCP, which get their DNS server from the router, will all get the same faster DNS server. Um, another way to do it is to shortcut the DNS process by using a local DNS server on the router. This is a little more of an advanced configuration topic and I'll get into this more in a later video. To implement the first option, you simply need to find out what's a better DNS server for you. I like to use this tool, DNS Benchmark by Steve Gibson. It's a really tight tool, um, and I'll put a link to it in the description below. But you can see here how it looks in action, finding the fastest DNS servers that just bubble up to the top. There's a few nuances to getting the best possible results from this tool. I won't get into all that here, but you guys can look all that up if you want, but it's pretty simple to use. Once we know which DNS IPs we want to use, we go back to our router config and usually where you configure your static IP address and general router configuration, you'll have an area to enter custom DNS servers and just pop them in right there and off you go. Since you can also configure your DNS locally, it can be kind of confusing knowing exactly what DNS server you're actually using. There are several different ways to test this out. And one easy way though is to go to dnsleaktest.com, hit the test button, and it'll come back and tell you what DNS server you use to run that test. And the, inside of that web page, when you hit the test button, they have a random URL which points to their DNS server and you'll hit that so they'll know what DNS server you use when you run the test. Okay, next it's a good idea to avoid wireless Wi-Fi repeaters, range extenders, and meshes. And when I say wireless, I'm referring to the link back to the router. Now, sometimes when coverage gets spotty, what people will do is they'll buy a wireless repeater that you just plug into the wall and it'll run on the same channel as your main router. But these types of repeaters can be problematic. If the repeater is using an ethernet connection or Mocha or Powerline adapters to get back to the router, then it's no big deal. But if it's using a wireless backhaul, it's basically using bandwidth that would otherwise be available for your devices. So I say avoid because it's not necessarily a terrible thing. If you've placed your router in a good central location and you just don't have the ethernet lines to do proper backhauls, then go ahead and do a mesh system that has multiple radios because that's sort of the best thing going right now in terms of these repeaters. And I think in the future it's gonna to continue to get better, but you need at least two radios to have a streamlined system that doesn't self interfere um, to where the performance degrades terribly. I'll put some links to these types of mesh systems in the description below. Okay, if your router supports it, you wanna use that QoS or SQM, which stands for Quality of Service and Smart Queue Management. What these technologies allow you to do is to prioritize your network traffic. So for example, if your kids are playing Roblox and watching 4K movies and you're trying to get some work done, uh, that can be a problem if you can't get enough bandwidth because of all the other traffic on your network. So these technologies will allow you to address those issues. In some cases, you can prioritize based on individual machines. Some cases you can prioritize based on ports. And in other cases, you can just do an egalitarian or fair treatment for all on your network. Again, every router is different. I'm running OpenWRT on my router and uh, I'm using the SQM package. There's a different package too called QoS. So yeah, research your router, see if it supports QoS or SQM. It'll definitely help reduce congestion on your network. And as a side benefit, it'll help reduce buffer bloat, which is a kind of latency you can get when you have a lot of congestion on your network. Okay, so hopefully you've been able to get your old router to work the way you want, but let's face it, sometimes you get to the end of the rope and you find out your router is just crap. If you go to upgrade your router, here's some things to think about. Number one, look for routers that are Wi-Fi certified because it should help with interoperability and security and as well reliability. I'll link the wifi.org product finder, which will help you find Wi-Fi certified routers. 
Okay, next be sure to look for devices that are four by four MIMO or multiple input, multiple output. Uh, as a minimum, I think it goes all the way up to eight by eight. A lot of routers today are only two by two or three by three. And basically MIMO is a kind of a multi-path um, technology which allows you to multiply how much capacity you get for your available bandwidth without adding actual bandwidth. So it's a pretty cool technology and as time goes on, more and more devices will support higher levels of MIMO. Some devices may only support two by two and that's gonna be your cap because it's gotta be on both sides. But uh, definitely try to make four by four your minimum there. Okay, next try to find a router that supports DFS or dynamic frequency selection. What this is is basically um, routers have an opportunity to use bandwidth that is normally reserved for radar and uh, certain routers have the logic program to um, detect if those radars are in use in your areas and if they're not you'll have more channels come available in the 5 gigahertz setting uh, at 80 megahertz width and you'll get basically four additional channels come available if your router supports DFS so uh, try to make that a priority if possible. Another piece of technology to look for would be the 802.11ac beamforming, sometimes called Wave 2. Basically, this means uh, if the router has multiple antennas, it can actually put more transmit power into a given antenna and put a, a larger lobe in a certain direction and increase the bit rate uh, by a certain amount. Okay, next, um, if you're an advanced user and you like to have a lot of ability to fine tune things on your router, definitely consider OpenWRT. Basically, it's an open source software that you can retrofit onto a new router or an old router. Um, and it's got some pretty nice features. Um, you don't necessarily have to be super advanced. And you don't have to use all the features. Um, I'm using it and I'm not really a propeller head, but uh, most guys who are, they do stuff via the command line, but it has a nice GUI that you can use. Um, so consider that and some routers are built already to be able to run OpenWRT. I will be getting into some videos on OpenWRT in this series on down the road, uh, but for now I'll put some links in the description below to help you guys find more information on it. Last point on the new routers, Wi-Fi 6 is coming. Um, it's probably going to be out in 2020 sometime. As of this video right now, it's still in draft form, so I wouldn't buy into the hype about Wi-Fi 6 support because if you get one now for Wi-Fi 6, uh, things could change and you might have problems with it down the road. So I wouldn't make it a priority quite yet. If you're watching this video in 2020 and it's already uh, come to fruition, um, definitely uh, get Wi-Fi 6 compatibility in your next router. One last note, guys, on making changes in general engineering troubleshooting. I've given you a lot of points here and when you go to troubleshoot your system and make a change, I would recommend make one change at a time, only turn one knob at a time, note the effect and put it back and then move on to the next and make that change, note the effect and put it back. And then when you've gone through everything, uh, you can see what had the greatest effect and was it positive or negative. And you might want to let it cook for a day or two for each change to make sure it didn't have any negative effect, for example. Uh, sometimes it can take a while for things to surface. And then, of course, ultimately you go back and apply all the changes which had a positive effect. So in this way, you know, you learn a lot. You learn more about what effect each thing has. And when you move on to your next router later, that information can help you out. Yes, it takes more time to do it that way, but doesn't everything that's worthwhile? So that's all for today. Be sure to stay tuned for more videos in this series on home networking and Wi-Fi routers. But as far as general tune-ups go on your home network, that's how it's done. Thanks for watching.